Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Back to the Cardboard. Hey, thanks for tuning in, and welcome back to part two of Evening with Pete Rose. Uh, it's a great episode. He's going to be talking about the Houston Astros Hall of Fame, his batting stance, and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's get with it. Can you walk us through, I believe it was roughly 25 years ago when you made the agreement with, with Bart Giamatti. Can you kind of walk us through what led up to that and what the agreement was? And, and if he had not have passed away so soon after that, do you feel like you would have... Well, I think he gave me a chance. Yeah, I signed an agreement with him that I could apply for reinstatement a year from, from that date. And uh, that was 89. That was 31 years ago. And three days after he signed the agreement, he dropped over dead. Now, who do I apply to? His, his, uh, his, his assistant, Bud Seeley? He didn't get a chance. He couldn't do that because he, he, was, in, he was in Bart's corner. And time just went by and went by and went by and went by and I quit worrying about it because I never knew I was, I was gonna get a chance. Hey, I screwed up. I've been on my team to win. It's wrong. I broke the rules. But every manager should bet on his team every night to win. Every jockey should bet on his horse to win. Every basketball coach should bet on his team to win every night. What did I do? I did everything in my power every damn night to win the game. And I understand the rules. I didn't at the time. I quit playing and I had, I had, to, had to have something else going on. And I had a lot of faith in my guys. I had some good players, man. Larkin, Sabo, Eric Davis, Parker, you know, Rand, uh, uh, Tracy Jones, yeah. Gary Reedus, Dibble, Browning, and Johnny Franco. You know, I, I, had, I had some good players. We had, we had a real good organization in those days. We had good players. But uh, I got caught and I shouldn't have did it, but I did it. And I'm gonna tell you right now, me betting on baseball, to my knowledge, didn't hurt one person in this audience. And it cost me 90 million. That's what it cost me. That's what I'd have made if I'd have stayed as managing the Reds. Maybe more. Three, three million a year for 30 years. I'd have made more net, including the commercials and off the field stuff. So I paid the consequences. I get a kick out. People say, they didn't penalize him enough. Well, what's enough? I've been suspended 30 years, 31 years. I could have killed her and I'd have been out by now. Do you hold out any hope that you're gonna get in? No, not when I'm alive. That's okay, I'm over that. If I've ever uh, given the honor of going to the Hall of Fame, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. I know what kind of guys are in the Hall of Fame. I know what I did as a player. I know what kind of player I was. My family knows what kind of player I was. My fans know what kind of player I was. You know, the Hall of Fame, they think they got a bunch of altar boys up there. You know, the guys never made no mistakes. You I know, know, my first Hall of Famer I played against was Stan Musial in 69. And every Hall of Famer went in the Hall of Fame since then, I either played against or with. So I got the dope on all of them. I would never disclose the dope, but there's not a bunch of altar boys up there. The Hall of Fame is about statistics. You got the stats, you go to the Hall of Fame. You know, there's a lot of a-holes that are in the Hall of Fame, but they got good records. Ty Cobb was the biggest jerk in the world. Babe Ruth was the nicest guy in the world. But Ty Cobb, he hated blacks. Imagine him playing today. He couldn't play today. And he was a really good player. I got along with blacks. Maybe that's why I'm not in there. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, but you know someday everything everything evens out. Everything evens out. But there again, uh, you might think this is funny for me to say this, but I believe this. Like I said earlier, I sign autographs 20 days a month, five hours a day in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'll guarantee you, I'm the only baseball player in a small town in America tonight talking about the game of baseball. Okay. And I don't bad about the game of baseball. I love the game of baseball.
baseball. I mean, there's a lot of great players in the game of baseball. There's a lot of not so great players. There's a lot of bad teams in the game of baseball. You know, you get through all the steroid stuff, then the Houston thing comes down the pipe. It'll be something else next year. You know, and I'm the only thing I don't like about baseball. I'm tired of baseball changing the rules every year. You can't slide in the second. You can't break up and play at home. You can't pitch inside. They're all worried about the, the, the length of the game. How are you going to speed up the game when you got nine innings and you got six minutes of commercials every inning? That's 54 minutes of commercials during every game. They're not going to eliminate the commercials because that's who's paying the bills. You ever notice how you fans, if, if, I don't know who you root for, but let's say you root for the, the Reds. Reds. Huh? The Reds, almost all of them. You root for the Reds and you go to game tomorrow night and the game's an hour and 55 minutes and they lose one to nothing. You're pissed on the way home. You come back the next night, the game's three hours and 50 minutes and the Reds, Reds won 15 to 12. You're happy as hell going home. Why, 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 why are we like that? You ever pan into TV and watch the Reds play? People are doing one of two things. Eating or talking on the phone. People complain to me about baseball tickets all the time. Baseball will always be the best bargain in sports because they play 81 games. Basketball plays 41. They, uh, football plays eight. Okay, so when you go to the game, next time you go to a game, eat before you go to the game. The guys who, the, the people who love you guys are the concessionaires. This guy, he just bought three hot dogs and four beers in a nine inning game. So he spent more money in, in concessions than he did for the ticket. But yet he bitches about the price of the ticket. Try going to a bingo game. Plus you get a horseshit product. <laughs> well, I know that guy. He's going to do better than three beers in the game. I can tell you that. But, that. but if you can afford it, go ahead and do it. But don't complain about the price of tickets. I see it every day. I talk about it every day. Hundreds of people every day. All I talk about is baseball and football, basketball. You know, I follow all sports. I, I do all sports. Um, talk a little bit about being a switch hitter, here's my question. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, know. I, I was a switch batter. Switch batter. Not a switch hitter. Switch batter. There's a big difference. Switch batter. If you know what I mean. Switch batter. Okay. Go ahead. And one thing that I always noticed that you you had a more significant crouch from the left side and a little bit more upright from the right side. Talk about that, and then my follow-up would be, what was your pre-game routine as far as cuts from both sides of the play? Well, we're, I'll answer your last question first. Because we were lucky in Cincinnati because we had Joe Nuxall to pitch batting practice and we had a left-hander facing us. <clears throat> and if a right-hander was facing us, I would bat left-handed in batting practice and vice versa. You know, I wouldn't, however I was gonna bat that night's way, I'd take batting practice. And to be honest, a good question, because I don't know if I crouch more, because sometimes you crouch more because it's easier to see the ball if it's twilight time. You know, I remember one time I was driving home, my wife said, did you notice you were crouching more left-handed tonight than normal? And I didn't know. I'm in the better class worry about hitting the damn ball. I ain't worried about what kind of cr crotch I got on. You know what I mean? But uh, I, when I got in the batter's box, I tried to be comfortable because if you're not comfortable, you can't hit. If you're not comfortable, you can't sleep. How many of you can sleep with a, with a headache? How many of you can sleep standing up? How many, how many can sleep in the chair? Our grandmas can sleep in the chair. How many of you sleep on your back, on your side, your stomach? We all sleep differently. And you usually sleep the, the way you're comfortable. When you bat, you try to bat to be comfortable. Because it's hard enough to hit the ball. Now you, got, you can't be in there worried about this or worried about that or my head hurts or my arm hurts. You got to worry about the damn ball because the guy's spitting on it and he's spinning and he's knuckling it and he's sliding it and he's doing all the different things with it.
and they're cheating in Houston. I don't, I don't know what those guys did, but if you told me what's, what was coming, I'd have got 5,000 hits. <laughs> it's easy to hit when you know what's coming, especially if you know it's a changeup, because all a pitcher tries to do, what a pitcher's goal is, when you're hitting it, is to get you out in your front foot. That's what he's trying to do, and that's usually what a changeup does, if you don't know a guy's got a good changeup. Now, if you know the changeup's coming, he throws it, you're still right here, he didn't fool you. And you got a good chance to put a good swing on it. That's all pitchers try to do is keep you off stride. And that's what a changeup does. It gets you out on your front foot. And they just were cheating on the changeup. If I t they tell me a changeup uh, coming, and if they don't buzz, or they don't bang in the cans, that means it's a fastball. And if you know what's coming, it's half the battle. You still got to hit the ball, and you still got to hit it away from a guy that's got a glove on. But it makes, it makes the challenge a lot easier. It really does. Uh, it's still difficult to hit a baseball, but if you know what's coming, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. And believe me, it's a lot easier. That stupid owner of the Houston Astro, well, it didn't, it didn't help him that much. It didn't make any difference. Did he ever play baseball before? And that's how bitch is a billionaire. How can you be a billionaire and be that stupid? <laughs> Donald Trump ain't stupid. I met seven presidents, you know that? Seven, yeah. I didn't, I didn't meet Clinton, I met his mom. I went to Oban Park with her, she was beautiful. Virginia Kelly was her name, she was the nicest lady. I know where Bill got his personality from, from his mom. I met Eisenhower when he was a general. I got two calls from uh, uh, Mr. Reagan, Ronald Reagan. He called me in my house one time on the way to the ballpark. He was on the way to Cincinnati to do a, a rally. And see, when I played baseball, I never got involved in politics. Not because I might like this gentleman here, but I can't get on the stage and talk about him because he gets 52%, 48% can't stand the son bitch. And I don't need him coming to the ballpark taking that out on me. And Ronald Reagan knew that. And he called me and he said, Pete, I'm sorry you can't be with us today. I understand your situation with us politicians. And I said, Mr. President, I'm sorry I can't be with you today too. He said, good luck in the game tonight. Okay, good, over now. Now he gets to the appearance downtown Fountain Square, 12 o'clock lunchtime. He gets up on the stage, he takes the microphone and he says, I talked to your captain today and he's sorry he can't be here. Now he's got me there. That's how smart these son bitches are. Right? And I was there, but I wasn't there. I was at the ballpark. Then we're getting ready. We're, we're at the uh, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium for the All-Century Celebration. And Jimmy Carter comes down. And it's um, Stan, me, Mays, Aaron, and Williams. And the guy says, Mr. Preston, can we get some pictures? Sure. So he stands between me and Hank and he took pictures. And when he was finished, Stan looked at me and said, them goddamn politicians are all like. I'm saying, man, this guy's not a Democrat. He's, like, he's a Republican. I said, what's the problem, Stanley? He said, you see where that son bitch stood for the picture? I said, yeah, he stood between me and Hank. He said, why do you think he stood there? I said, I don't know why. Because you can't cut the son bitch out of the picture. <laughs> Always stand in the middle of a pitcher and they can never cut you out of the pitcher. That's, that's the way politicians think. I don't know, I don't know what those, those five guys for the Democrats are doing in those debates. I mean, I think I'm in another country. Are they speaking English up there? I mean, maybe the problem is they're all talking at the same time.